John Maynard Keynes wrote the book on modern macro. The man you need when the economy's off track. You see, it's all about spending. Here, the register cha-ching. John Maynard Keynes came from what I'd call the intellectual uh, upper middle class. That's to say, he came from a Cambridge family. He spent m most of his life as a fellow of King's College, Cambridge. And so he always looked down on England from quite a great height of uh, what you call the uh, intellectual bourgeoisie. You know me, modesty, still I'm taking a bow. So say it loud and say it proud, we're all Keynesians now. The crucial uh, uh, watershed for him was the First World War. He was drawn into government service, he became a treasury official, and, and, and the world had changed irretrievably. And he uh, tried intellectually to come to grips with these things. He became a public figure with his denunciation of the Versailles Treaty, the economic consequences of the peace, in which he said, if we go ahead with this treaty, vengeance will not limp. And that was a bestseller. It was quite controversial, because what he attacked very boldly, and from a position of knowledge, because he was assumed to know what he was talking about, having been in the Treasury, he attacked the peacemaking of, of Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. He was scathing about Woodrow Wilson, and um, his attack on Woodrow Wilson um, uh, is said to have contributed to the Senate's rejection of American uh, membership of, of the League of Nations. Then there was the Great Depression, which again dislodged his thought from more orthodox grooves to really revolutionary thinking. And that was the general theory of employment, interest and money, which was published in 1936, written at the bottom of the Great Depression. Depression, recession, now your question's in session. Have a seat and I'll school you in one simple lesson. Basic idea was you, you, you had uh, employment determined by, by aggregate demand in the economy, aggregate spending. C, I, G, all together gets to Y. Keep that total grow and watch the economy fly. And if that fell below the level um, that was needed to maintain full employment, you had a multiplied downward effect so that you got into another position of rest at a lower level of activity. And there was no obvious reason unless something turned up, which uh, he thought should be the government, to move back uh, to the higher position from which you've started. So if that flow is getting low, does it matter the reason we need more government spending? Now it's stimulus season. So it's the idea you start at full employment, then there's a big disturbance, usually in the financial system. Ooh, 1929, the big crash. We didn't bounce back, economies in the trash. And then the economy runs down to a low level where it remains basically, unless there's some external impulse or stimulus to lift it to a higher level. I had a real plan, any fool can understand. The advice real simple, boost aggregate demand. Now he thought that could come just from new inventions, um, so some, some technological changes which got people going again, but you couldn't rely on them, so you had to rely on the government. Because business is driven by the animal spirits, the bull and the bear, and there's reasons to fear it effects on capital investment, income and growth. Animal spirits is just his way of expressing the fact that um, your decisions to invest depend on your feelings about the future and that these are not calculable in the way that um, uh, I think economists tended to assume that somehow you can work out probabilities, calculate the odds and then your investment decisions are completely rational in that framework. Um, you don't need animal spirits if you know what the odds are. Um, you just need calculating ability. Um, but you need animal spirits when you don't. And then you, you have these choices. I mean, if you feel very fearful about the future, you hoard money. You, you, in, you, you, you just have large cash balances. You wait to see what's going to happen. And money is a form of security. Money has utility. Money is a store of value. And no classical economists really took the store of value uh, uh, function of money seriously until Keynes put it into the center of his picture. Savings is destruction, that's the paradox of thrift. Don't keep money in your pocket or that growth will never live. Keynes regarded uh, uh, saving as just non-consumption. So the paradox of thrift was that if everyone uh, decided to increase their saving, 
because um, they thought that this was a prudent thing to do, and it, you know that's the natural reaction in times of difficulty, you sort of start saving more. Uh, you wouldn't get an increase in saving, but a reduction in saving because um, your act of non-consumption would drag down aggregate spending, and as saving was closely linked to income, as incomes fell, savings fell. And therefore, the attempt by everyone to save more would result in less aggregate saving because through the decline in income. See, it's all about spending. Here, the register cha-ching. Circular flow, the dough is everything. You could say that there was an underlying hostility or an underlying feeling that the tendency to save um, was stronger than the inducement to invest historically. That people, because, because uh, the future was so uncertain, it was so subject to so many uh, unpredictable events, that people tended uh, to save money um, and try and uh, get some security via saving rather than to embark their money on enterprises. That's why um, your spending programs um, uh, have to be aimed at increasing, I think, increasing the, the consumption of those whose, whose tendency to save is least in the economy, who, who are more likely to spend a higher proportion of their income. If you give lots of extra spending power to the very wealthy, they'll save quite a large proportion of it for whatever reason. Look, the problem was a decline in aggregate spending. Total spending was not sufficient to buy the goods that the economy was capable of producing. And therefore, that a, lot, a, a fraction of uh, resources, human resources, capital resources, would be un unemployed. Therefore, the government's job was to increase, get spending up. There were two ways of getting spending up. You could either do something to stimulate private investment, and that was on the whole via interest rate policy, or you could um, spend the money yourself as a government, and that is you run, um, you enlarge your fiscal deficit or you run fiscal deficits. He thought that the monetary route was uncertain because it depended on how monetary policy was received. Um, you could lower interest rates to almost zero, but if, if, if confidence was low, the banks wouldn't lend to customers. Uh, they would just enlarge their cash balances. You might have, have required such a low rate of interest that it was unfeasible because there'd be a lower bound, and then you'll get a liquidity trap. And if the central bank's interest rate policy tanks a liquidity trap, that new money stuck in the banks. What he thought uh, um, the, the function of interest rates was, um, uh, the way he put it, was to equilibrate uh, the demand for cash with the supply of cash, rather than to equalize the demand for investment with the supply of saving. And, and the reason he thought that was simply that um, if saving was done um, uh, not to invest uh, for the purpose of investment, but uh, as a security, um, in other words, if your act of non-consumption consisted of um, simply accumulating cash, then you wouldn't, that act would not um, uh, 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 cause a change in interest rates. And therefore, interest rate couldn't be regarded as equilibrating saving and investment because the, that depended on the picture, that depended on the view that all saving was done for the purpose of investment. If investment was falling off, you lowered the interest rate, and then, of course, you'd have more investment, and ditto the other way around. But he didn't see this tight connection between saving and investment, which the classical theory um, assumed to be the case. And therefore, the rate of interest was quite different in his system. And, and, and that, incidentally, was why he didn't think that a lowering interest rates was a reliable mechanism mechanism for recovery. So forget about saving, get it straight out of your head. Like I said, in the long run, we're all dead. The phrase, in the long run, we're all dead, um, I should actually finish that quotation because I think it's, um, they, people only remember the, the first part of it. What he said was, um, in the long run, we're all dead. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task if all they can tell us once the storm is long past that the sea is flat again. So that's the full quotation. The context is the quantity theory of money. He's attacking quantity theory of money as a short-run theory. 
He's saying, yes, in the long run, uh, prices rise proportionately to the increase in the money supply, but in the short run, they don't. In the short run, there are output uh, effects. And so uh, that's, that was his homage to the quantity theory of money, but he kicked it into the, into the long run. Persistent unemployment, the result of sticky wages. Keynesians, um, when, when, they, when they were trying to make sense of the general theory and what its central message was, used to say that the reason economies um, don't bounce back immediately from some disturbance is because of sticky wages and prices. They actually said rigid wages and prices. They don't move and therefore output has to move. Um, that's not in the general theory. Keynes never talked about sticky prices. They used sticky prices, they stuck it on to their idea of what Keynes was about because they couldn't explain um, how output um, could fall if wages and prices were perfectly flexible. The fact is, of course, that they weren't perfectly flexible, but they are, they are flexible in the general theory. Um, only output is the stronger impulse. And the reason Keynes said that uh, wages and prices don't do the job is because of uncertainty. People don't know what the new equilibrium wage is. You're in a disequilibrium situation at that moment. And that is why, although prices and wages do have some adjustment, they don't adjust fast enough. And so output falls a speedier than wage and price adjustments. That was, I think, the core of his theory. And so it's correct to say that uh, there were, uh, that prices are sticky and they're not rigid. Waiting for recovery? Seriously? That's outrageous. Basically, if you wanted a surefire method of getting the economy rapidly uh, back, to something like full employment, it's the government that had to spend uh, uh, fiscal policy. Now, there were also, sorry, I, I should have said, there are two ways uh, of conducting fiscal policy as well. You could either cut taxes, and that would be one way of enlarging the, the, the deficit, or you could increase spending um, yourself as a government, or you could uh, just um, uh, uh, increase spending and raise, and, 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 and you, could, you could have a balanced budget as well, but it would just be a larger share of, of the national income. So there, were, there, was, there were different types of fiscal policy, but on the whole, I thought, uh, I think he thought that uh, the government should spend the money itself. Deficits could be the cure you've been looking for. Let the spending soar now that you know the score. There's always going to be waste in any, any programs, any government programs. You've got to, and, and people get worried about waste, um, but you've got to balance the waste that is necessarily involved in any government stimulus programs against the waste that is involved with allowing unemployment to uh, rise and, uh, and, and, and reach such high levels. The private sector is enormously wasteful, actually. Only a lot of this waste is, is covered up. But it's very, very wasteful insofar as it produces slumps. Now, if it, you know, if, it, if it's efficient, there are, no, there are no big fluctuations such as we've experienced. An efficient market system does not produce that if it satisfies the normal efficiency requirements. So the argument is, ah, oh, well, this wasn't really a proper market because it was already so interfered with. It was bound to sort of a malfunction. But, you know, you can argue, one can argue about that. But having said that, you still have these two things to compare. Government waste, um, which is inevitable, against the waste of human resources, of mass unemployment, uh, of a very high level. And I would, I would say, OK, you just put up with some government waste. You know it's a fact of life. Governments aren't perfect. Uh, they make mistakes. They have lots of ill-designed programs. But I would still take that rather than uh, live with 10% um, unemployed uh, for five years. My general theory's made quite an impression. Revolution! I transformed the econ profession. You know me, modesty, still I'm taking a bow. So say it loud and say it proud, we're all Keynesians now. 